We begin today with the Luann Day Award, our most prestigious award for exceptional work in the humanities and social sciences. The Luann Day Award was established in 2017 by Purdue alumna Luann Day, the Lauren D. Bain Distinguished Professor Emerita in Public Health and Medicine at the University of Texas School of Public Health. To advance public health access, Ade has served on several multinational federal and state boards and commissions, including the National Academy of Medicine, the National Cancer Institute, and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality. But Purdue was where she received her master's and doctoral degrees in sociology, as well as an honorary, honorary doctorate in social sciences. Each year, the Luanna Day Award recognizes a member of the Purdue faculty who made a major impact on his or her field in the humanities and social sciences. This year, Luanna Day Award is given posthumously to Marsha L. Gentry. Dr. Gentry was a professor of gifted, talented, and creative studies and the executive director of the Gifted Education Research and Resource Institute in the College of Education. She was nominated by Professor Jennifer Richardson. The award is given in recognition of Dr. Gentry's major impact in research and scholarship as part of her 2019 national report, Access Denied System Failure on Representation in Gifted Programs. This report provides concrete data and recommendations to address elitism, classism, sexism, and segregation in gifted education. With us today to receive the award on Dr. Gentry's behalf are her colleagues, Dr. Nielsen Pereira and Dr. Kristen Seward. They will present a lecture titled The Legacy of Marsha Gentry, Excellence, Equity, and Talent Development. At the end of their lecture, they will take um, some questions. One of the things I do want to remark on, her husband is also here today um, to celebrate, and he said to us that this is an award that meant so much to her. And so we're really extra pleased that we're able to honor her posthumously. And with that, uh, can we have our speakers come on sta stage? And maybe her husband would like to come on stage and receive the award for her. Dr. Marsha Gentry was a renowned and impactful scholar in the field of gifted education. She was an amazing educator, uh, an engaging speaker, and a champion for gifted and talented students from culturally um, and linguistic uh, diverse backgrounds and from underrepresented populations in gifted education. It's uh, an honor to be here to speak about Dr. Gentry's legacy uh, and work uh, along with my colleague, Dr. Uh, Kristen Seward. Um, and Dr. Gentry was our doctoral advisor. Uh, she was a co-author, a colleague, and a dear friend. Um, and I also want to recognize again Steve and, and thank him for being here um, uh, during this very uh, special day. Um, you see some pictures of, of, of Steve and Dr. Gentry and her daughter. Um, and also, she was very proud to wear the, the black and gold and, and to represent Purdue. In this picture here, you see Dr. Gentry speaking at, a, at, at an event in Medellin, and she's wearing her, her black and gold dress and, and really uh, proudly representing Purdue University. I was in the audience uh, 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 that day. 
In this presentation, we'll talk about the total school cluster grouping, uh, which uh, is a widely uh, used and research-based uh, model that Dr. Gentry created and, and researched throughout her career. The Gifted Education Research and Resource Institute uh, programs for, for gifted students, uh, which under Dr. Gentry's directorship became more inclusive and increasingly more diverse and open to students from all backgrounds. One of the ways that she did that and, and broadened opportunities for students, for gifted and talented students, is through Project HOPE, uh, which provided scholarships for students um, over approximately 15 years. Hundreds of students uh, came to, to, to Purdue's campus to participate in our summer programs and in our Saturday programs as part of that project. And the HOPE scale is one of the outcomes of that project, which is an instrument uh, designed specifically to identify and to help teachers identify students from underserved populations for, for gifted and talented uh, services. And finally, as, as mentioned before, the Access Denied Report, uh, which is pro possibly her most uh, groundbreaking uh, contribution to the field of gifted education. Uh, one of the things that Dr. Gentry did in the Access Denied Report is she defined missingness in gifted education. And she defined missingness as students who um, are not identified as gifted, either because her schools are not identifying students, and there are many schools in the country that are basically not identifying any students, or because they, they under-identify students from certain uh, populations. Um, and because of that, we end, we end up with several students uh, who are simply missing and not identified as gifted and, and, and remain underserved um, in, in, in our schools. The Access Denied report uh, addressed uh, loss, access, equity, and, and missingness uh, in gifted education. And for this report, uh, I was one of the authors, and I had the pleasure of working uh, with Dr. Gentry uh, in this, uh, on this report. We used publicly available data collected by the Office of Civil Rights biennially um, from every public school in the country. Schools are required to submit these data. Um, so these are actually census data um, that, we, that we use for this report. Um, access in this report was defined as attending a school that, I, that identifies students as, uh, with gifts and talents. And in this uh, map, you see the, the state grades and percentages of students with access to identification. One of the things that we found is that access uh, at the national level, about approximately 67% of students have access to gifted identification or to gifted programming. And as we know, having access is, is really essential. I mean, if you don't enter the school that doesn't even identify students as, as gifted and talented, then you are out of luck and you basically don't, do not have access to programming, the programming that you need. To look at the state of Indiana, we're actually doing better than the, than the, um, than the, the, the national uh, average. And uh, schools, public schools in Indiana actually uh, have 84% uh, of the students in, um, in Indiana have access to this, uh, to, to gifted and talented identification. And so you might think, well, we're doing very well in Indiana, right? We're doing better than the national average. However, there's more to this report. We, um, as part of this report, we created uh, report cards for each state in the nation and for the nation. And this is the top part of the Indiana report card. And Indiana actually mandates by law identifying and serving, uh, providing services to gifted or high ability students, as they are called in Indiana. Um, but however, this mandate is par only partially funded. With regards to access to identification, Indiana received a grade of B, and, and the, the methods for, for assigning those grades are, uh, that's described in the, in the report. And Indiana ranked 16th in, in the nation. So still doing fairly well. However, with regards to equity of access between Title I and non-Title I schools, Indiana received a grade of F and ranked 31st in the nation. Title I schools are schools with higher, high uh, um, concentration of students of, uh, from poverty or from lower income backgrounds. 
which means that students from lower income backgrounds are actually less likely to have access and, and thus to be identified as gifted. Um, students in Title I schools um, are identified at about 58% of the rate of, uh, uh, of non -title, students in non-Title I schools. So if you are in one of those schools, you are, again, you are out of luck and you, there, there's no opportunity for you to actually be identified. With regard to equity of access by race, Indiana received grades ranging from A to C, and when we looked at equity, we looked at four populations that have traditionally been underrepresented in gifted programs, American Indian and Alaska Native students, black students, Latinx, and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander students. And so we're doing fairly well with equitable access, except for black students, which um, don't have the same access in public schools in Indiana. When we looked at equity, and to look at equity, one of the things that was also new in this report is that we only used, looked at schools that actually identify. In most of the previous reports on equity of uh, identification in gifted uh, schools, um, they looked at, at uh, all schools, or, or, and which means that, that the, the representation indices, which is the measure of equity that we use, were actually uh, underestimated. The representation index is calculated as the percentage of the, a gifted population from a specific group divided by the percentage of the school population, the total school population that is from that group. So if, to give you an example, a school with an enrollment of 1,000 students and 500 or 50% of those who are Hispanic and with 50 students identified as gifted, but only five or 10% of those students who are Hispanic, we have a representation index of 0.2. 10% divided by 50%, uh, which means that in this school, Hispanic students are severely underrepresented and, and, and are not being identified at the same rate as, as the other students. Ideally, a representation index would, would be as close to one as possible. That's when, when there is equitable representation. So th these maps, they show the representation indices um, for Asian and white uh, students in, in all schools, um, and what we see here, and the finding here is basically that students from those um, racial groups are well represented in every state where we were able to uh, calculate these representation indices. Uh, there was not enough data for a few states, um, but as you can see, green shows, I mean, a, a grade of A, regardless of where you are in the country, if you're Asian or white, you're probably you're most, more likely to be identified as gifted. So that might tell you, well, yes, we're doing really well uh, when it comes to representation. However, here's another story for you. A completely different picture when we look at students from the four populations that I had previously mentioned, which, um, and this, we are, we are, we're also looking at representation indices for all states and the nation and those are actually, those, those students from those groups are actually underrepresented in, in the majority of the states where we were able to calculate those uh, representation indices. Um, lo looking at Indiana in particular, uh, in particular uh, we had representation indices ranging from 0.46 to 0.74, um, with uh, black students being the ones that are mo most severely uh, underrepresented uh, in schools in Indiana, again. Finally, we look at, looked at missingness in gifted education, uh, which was defined uh, for the upper boundary. We, we looked at students who would, have or would or should have been identified if uh, every school identified at the average identification rate in the state. So ideally, we would have every school identifying at about the same level. However, we know that that's not the case in many schools do not identify or, ide or under-identify some populations. So, and for the upper boundary, uh, that was calculated as students who should have been identified if um, schools identified at the same le level, at the same rate as the non-Title I schools. And what we found is that there are between 2.1 and 3.6 students who are actually missing from, from gifted education. Considering that in the country about 3.2 million students are, are identified, 
we could have more students missing from gifted programs than actually identified in gifted programs. And, and that's probably one of the main findings. And this is the one that actually made the news. So this report was, uh, was um, uh, covered in, in, in the news media across the country. And so you see here this headline straight from the, the, the report results saying that up to 3.6 million students should have been, uh, have been uh, be labeled as gifted, gifted by or aren't. Um, some of the, the, the reports, the news media reports, also talking, talked about the need to revisit gifted education um, and also that schools often fail to identify gifted and talented students and that's all coming straight from this report. I will also say that these results have been used um, mostly at the state level to start to effect some changes in, in, in um, gifted identification and gifted policies. Um, so many, many people, many, many gifted edu uh, education advocates have been using these and some changes have, have started to, uh, to happen because of, because of this report. And with that, I turn it over to my friend, my colleague, uh, Dr. Kristen Seward. Thank you, Nielsen. Well, the statistics there on Indiana might have you feeling a little low right now or a little more thoughtful, and Marcia would say that's good. In Marcia's research, she was not afraid to tell the truth, and she did that through statistics. And her studies constantly challenged our field to do better to make differences for all kinds of kids because we know that gifted students come from every demographic category that there is. And so I want to turn this around a little bit and give you some hope. And I'm using that word intentionally because that defines Dr. Gentry's research and her career very well. So one of the ways uh, that she affected with an A and made effective with an E changes in our field is through our uh, summer enrichment programs and our Super Saturdays and um, our Super Summer programs. And so I have some pictures here of, of some kiddos who've come to our camps and you can see they're a diverse group. And Marsha was always about telling us about how diversity enriches our camps and we see that every year. We see that on the Saturday programs, we see that in the summer programs, and it's something that convinces us that yes, diversity is what we need. Diversity is something that lifts us all and helps us all be more aware and be stronger, not only in our scholarship, but also in our service. So you'll see some of the fun things we do in camp. A recent change we made on a Super Saturday is we uh, created a, a caregiver child um, experience. And so, you know, we've grown with the times, um, we've changed some things regarding our youth programs, but the thing that has remained the same is Marsha's dream, Marsha's hope, that when we have diverse populations attend our camps, that we will all be better for it. One of the initiatives that Marcia started early in her career was the Native American Research Initiative. And she really wanted to expand access to gifted programming and better identification for this particular group of students. The Project HOPE is what she called it. And HOPE stands for Having Opportunities Promotes Excellence. When it comes to identification, it's important for you to know that Dr. Gentry did not want us to really rely on standardized test scores or IQ scores, that she wanted us to look at giftedness differently. And if she could get rid of the G word, she probably would. Her, her frame and, and our frame as well is talent development. Recognizing that all students have learning strengths. And our job as educators is to develop those strengths. So Marsha's idea of gifted education was very broad. We do recognize that there are some students who are very far above that of, you know, the ability level of their peers. We're not saying there's, there are no gifted students. But what we would prefer is rather than testing and sorting kids, that we assess their learning needs and we serve them. That seems like a pretty logical, common sense change, right? 
uh, but it has been met with some resistance, not only in our dear state of Indiana, but uh, in, the, in the United States as well. Nielsen already mentioned the HOPE rating scale. This scale, Marcia uh, developed early in her career. It was then published in 2015. But um, this scale identifies students through behaviors, gifted behaviors, such as shows high interest in a particular topic, asks intriguing questions, won't let a problem go, things like that, gifted behaviors. And so this scale includes academic as well as social and affective components of giftedness. So we're looking at giftedness differently. There are only 11 questions on this rating scale and teachers can fill those out pretty quickly um, for their students as they get to know them. So it's been something that we would love to see it used more broadly, um, but it has been something that we have promoted through Jerry and through our own research. Total school cluster grouping, I would say, is one of Dr. Gentry's most well-known contributions, aside from the Access Denied report. Um, total school cluster grouping is Talent development for all students. Cluster grouping, uh, this theory and, and the research that we've done on it has shown that when students are clustered based on their learning needs and they're served by teachers who've been trained in gifted education pedagogy and have been uh, given certain clusters to focus on instead of the wide range of abilities that may exist in their classroom that all students achieve. More students are identified with high ability. Fewer students are not scoring high enough on standardized tests. And it's just an amazing way to think about gifted education and practicing it differently. A lot of people think about gifted education as more of a tracking kind of service for students. But that's not what Marcia hoped. Through cluster grouping, the whole school would be clustered, kids would be served based on their needs, all students would achieve, and there would be flexible movement, hopefully all toward more achievement, right? The higher clusters than anyone uh, you know, retreating back to lower clusters. One thing Marcia was definitely, maybe more than anything, she was very competitive. And I appreciated that about her. She was always promoting us as graduate students and as faculty. I, I took this picture, put this picture in because um, we have a graduate student research um, competition at our national conference. And Marcia was always on us, you know, get that in, do that, you gotta do that. And so there aren't very many of these awards that are given out. I think maybe, would you say 10, maybe? and we got one, two, three, four, five, six. When that would happen, Marsha would just be beaming. She's like, yes, this is my, you know, these are my kids. These are the people who are going to make a difference in education in the future. So she was always so proud of us. The other picture is just a few of the graduate students that she served, um, maybe as their advisor, but whether you were her advisee or not, she was advising you. Um, and so she just has such an influence in our lives. And that influence will continue. Um, you know, Nielsen mentioned missingness. We miss Marcia every day. But we know that her legacy will live on through what we do at the center and through what we do with our research and scholarship. Thank you for honoring her. It is a very well-deserved award for Dr. Marcia Gentry. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for us related to Dr. Gentry's work? Here's one. Oh, here, sorry. We have a microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, the, uh, the questionnaire 
that uh, you had to um, figure, yes, that. Um, is that being passed around to the school? It, it is, or is it, is it being met with um, excitement? Are people resistant to it, or? I think in our United States of America, Nielsen can correct me if I'm wrong, we're having a really hard time moving away from testing and sorting. Because that's kind of safe, like you're in or you're out. Mm -hmm. But that's not equitable. That's, it's, it's not a good way. It's not the way Marsha wanted to do gifted education. Right. We need to assess strengths and needs and provide hope. I mean, having opportunities promotes excellence. If there's one thing she did um, really well with our Jerry Youth Programs is she wrote grants to bring many um, students from minoritized populations as well as those from low-income families. And when they put that Jerry T-shirt on, you couldn't tell a difference, right? It Absolutely. just became invisible. Yeah. I just think that this is, yeah. it is such a logical way because I remember when I was growing up, a really long time ago, um, you know, you're tested on so many different things, and these are the things that actually count. So I love the fact that she put that out there. It, and it, so it is. It is being used. It is used uh, across the country. I don't know what the numbers are exactly. It was published by. It's currently being published by Rutledge, um, and I was actually surprised a couple of months ago. I was looking. I was going to a state to speak at a conference. And then I was, went on their website, the Department of Education website, to see what measures were recommended, and the HOPE scale was there. So I don't know exactly. It was one of the measures that was actually recommended. It is being used. We're just not completely sure how widely used. It's also been used in research. Uh, we have two federal grants um, and, um, that, that currently um, that use the HOPE scale as, as one of the measures for, for identification. So I know I'm using it in five schools, Kristen and her new grant, uh, which Marsha received a 3.2 million grant a couple weeks before she, <laughs> she um, passed away. She's, used, she's going to be using it in another five schools or so. So, so it, is, it is being used it, and, and um, it was well received, and, and, and teachers appreciate, especially the fact that it's, that it's short. It's, it's easy to implement because there are other instruments that take 30 minutes, one hour to, to fill out. This is fairly simple and straightforward. Yeah. Thank you. I also want to add, if anyone else has a question, please raise your hand. But um, one thing I really appreciated about Dr. Gentry is that when something she developed was developed with grant money, no matter federal, state, whatever, grant money, she wanted to make it available for free. And so the HOPE scale for a long time was on our Jerry website for free until, you know, a publisher wanted to grab hold of it. But uh, yes, I really appreciate that about her. Very generous with her scholarship and the things that she created uh, to influence gifted education for the better. And then related to that, uh, after it was published, one of the things that, that she wanted to make sure that she and the authors would not profit. So actually any, any proceeds from selling this, this instrument actually go to our center, the Gifted Education Research and Resource Institute, to provide scholarships for students from underserved populations. And that's in, in the, 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 the technical manual. And that's one of the things that she wanted to make sure, because a lot of test developers profit. It's a huge business, but she didn't want that to be uh, the case. She wanted to make sure that the proceeds would go towards the students that she, she wanted to benefit from this. I just want to add, I love the name Hope uh, for that because I, I think it's really about every child having hope uh, and opportunity and that's really what we need to continue uh, 